The slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against the sea of troubles and by opposing end them, to die, to sleep, no more. Well, Billy Shakespeare, if that is your real name, have I got a cure for Hamlet's insomnia? Imagine a complete afterthought of a WWE pay-per-view taking place in the shadows of one of the company's biggest markets. Imagine if that pay-per-view dragged on endlessly, stretched out for no discernible reason, with a pointless talking segment, filler bouts galore, and some unsatisfying match finishes. Top it off with a sluggish main event that literally had fans filing for the exits like they were fleeing a crime scene. Well, you don't have to imagine it, because in 2018, WWE had the nerve to cobble all of these tedious elements together and try to pass it off as a premium card. If Claudius had booked the show, Hamlet would have killed him sooner. WWE Backlash 2018 is one of the worst shows ever. <sighs> yep. It's one of those shows. Now, for the purposes of finishing this review before I reach the age of advanced decrepitude, I've instructed the assembled crew here to make sure I stay alert and awake. Now, if they wanted to pry my eyelids open clockwork orange style, but I was able to haggle them down to a simple cattle prodding. Now, the 2018 backlash wasn't anything fancy either, in part because it had misfortune of following two major WWE events. And those two major WWE events, while not downright terrible, did leave a kind of sour taste in the universe's collective mouth. Now first, there was WrestleMania 34. You won't find WrestleMania 34 here on Worst Wrestling Shows Ever, but you might find it on our future sister series, Worst Final 45 Minutes, or so, of a show ever. That's because WWE, in their infinite, we're idiot-proof wisdom, gave us an incredible first 90 minutes or so, and followed up with a decent, if unspectacular, middle, but then finished with, well, one, a WWE title match that fell a little short of the admittedly unfairly high expectations, a random fourth grader beating Sheamus and Cesaro, and then three, a Brock Lesnar and Roman Reigns universal title bout, so poorly constructed that a safety inspector would have put his level on it, watched it immediately crash to the floor and then turned to Vince and went, yeah, nah, mate. You know those made for TV movies for the, you know, the woman meets a guy that seems like a dream come true. And then halfway through, there are some like faint red flags. And by the end, we all realize he's a heartless dick with a house of horrors wedged in his crawl space. Well, I've never seen any of those movies, but I'm told WrestleMania 34 was a little bit like that. Now, normally, WrestleMania would immediately beget the $50 non-refundable rematch blow-off extravaganza for fans that reluctantly accept repetition, later shortened to, well, just backlash. But this year, WWE took a significant detour on the road from WrestleMania. Less than three weeks following WrestleMania, WWE kicked off their lucrative partnership with Saudi Arabia by holding the greatest Royal Rumble in Jeddah. Due to the name, some of us were expecting, you know, a five hour event that was just the 1992 Royal Rumble aired twice in succession. But instead, the greatest Royal Rumble was a stadium show that was basically a half ambitious WrestleMania, half 2K mod gone haywire. There was a 50 man Royal Rumble match, a fake Yokozuna, Titus O'Neil falling on his face, a bunch of gimmick matches, a lame cage match ending, a little bit more on that later, some scattered propaganda, a lack of women, and a much discussion after the fact about those last two items. Turns out WWE being a part of Saudi Vision 2030 left more than a few fans feeling a little icky. And that ickiness would only increase with later visits, you know, see Khashoggi, Taker Goldberg, and the flight delay. But valid complainants notwithstanding, Greatest Royal Rumble did at least feel like an event loaded with big name part-timers, a who's who of, you know, contemporary stars, an impressive stadium setting. After two stadium spectacles in a row, mixed as their receptions were, anything with considerably less glitz and, you know, pizzazz was going to feel like a real letdown. Lucky us, we only had to wait nine days for WWE to unleash said letdown. Now, before we settle in, let's make ourselves a little bit more comfortable. Oh. That's better. Now, because largest amount of participants Royal Rumble took place a mere 216 hours out from Backlash, that meant that the storyline squeeze headed into Backlash was going to be tighter than Shawn Michaels' refereeing shorts. Instead of just being, you know, the WrestleMania rematch show, Backlash would instead serve leftovers from two 
windfalling monstrosities. <sighs> Let's see what it had in store for us. We'll start with the WWE title match. A rematch from the prior two pay-per-views as AJ Styles defends against the now heel Shinsuke Nakamura, who, since losing to Styles at Mania, has been feeling a little bit testy. Get it? Because he, he likes to hit Styles in the, in the balls. <laughs> It's your typical love story, really. You know, the, the guy wins the Rumble. Guy meets ex-New Japan rival turned WWE champion for the title. Guy fails to win the title in a slightly underwhelming showdown. So Guy emphatically makes champagne out of the other guy's grapes. Guy then challenges other guy again because there's an Eastern Hemisphere stadium to fill and Guy and other guy battle to an unsatisfying non-finish and even more middling match. They'll both make more in one day than any of us any of us will ever make in our entire lifetime. So yeah, basically the same plot as The Notebook. Except this time, Nakamura and Styles will face off once more in a non-DQ match, which will surely, surely settle the score. The third time would not be the charm for Roman Reigns, however, as the big dog was spluttering on from his mission to win Brock Lesnar's universal title. First, he was screwed over against Lesnar at WrestleMania after well, okay, actually, he wasn't screwed over. He was—he just nearly like bled to death while enduring more F5s than a slow browser. It was kind of kind of a clean loss that one. But despite being soundly ripped apart by cocaine bear Scandinavian cousin, Roman Reigns got a rematch with Lesnar at Gur. Anyway, this time inside of a steel cage. Somehow WWE managed to book a screw finish in a cage match as Reigns speared Lesnar into the mesh, causing the wall to collapse, thus triggering the seldom enforced clause in Brock Lesnar's contract that reads, in the event of a cage wall collapse, Mr. Lesnar may take his belt and go home for a minimum of 100 days. Now you can understand why referees in UFC kind of keep the, keep the fighters in the middle of the octagon so, so Lesnar just doesn't run away. So while Brock Lesnar was skipping through the meadows in the tulips of scenic Saskatchewan, Roman was paired with a freshly returned Samoa Joe for a pretty random match at Backlash. Really, there was kind of just a big rift in the Reigns versus insert blank opponent portion of the Backlash card, and Joe was basically just a, a roll of duct tape entering to, you know, like pseudo Godzilla music. Lesnar may have been busy doing literally anything else, but Backlash did boast its usual assortment of WrestleMania reprisals. Joining Styles Nakamura was a Raw Women's title match between Nia Jax and Alexa Bliss, and two thirds of the Mania IC title bout as new champ Seth Rollins faced The Miz. The SmackDown Women's title would be at stake as Carmella would defend her newly won championship against the person she cashed in James Ellsworth briefcase on in Charlotte Flair. Yes, we do remember that he was the one that pulled the briefcase down. Rounding out the title picture was a match pitting Jeff Hardy against Randy Orton. Excuse me. For the US title in 2018. Man, wrestling's weird. This match has happened quite a bit. And if you think that's weird, check this one out. Big Bill versus Brian Danielson, which was set up by Stokely Hathaway sending his client back in time T-800 style to prevent the American Dragon from challenging MGF for the AEW world title in the future year of 2023. Okay, it's actually just WWE having a recently cleared Daniel Bryan babyface and an admittedly cold big cast in a really random singles match from the SmackDown brand. But I think I like my version better. The Hell in the Sequel, Matt Hardy shows up as the V8. You get it. Just like that joke though, some things just aren't funny. And one of those things was Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn getting repeatedly bullied by Braun Strowman and Bobby Lashley in 2018. The four men were like shoehorned into a pretty pointless looking tag team match all around built on the premise of the muscly good guys make the bumbling bad guys look like idiots because it amuses them. And this was before we got Strowman repeatedly trying to ruin Owen's life and before Zayn tried to expose Lashley by having his highly acclaimed well, sisters, you know, Max Caster in a wig, reveal some inane secrets about him. Now, you're not going to believe this, but a week after Backlash, when tickets went on sale for an indie pay-per-view promoted by two t-shirt salesmen and a reincarnated Stardust, the 11,000 seat venue was sold out in under, well, 30 minutes. In 2018, we were flipping starved for an alternative. Backlash alone didn't send thousands upon thousands of fans fleeing towards you know, the Windy City, but a show like this had many lapsing WWE fans declaring that they were all in on something different. As for Backlash, eh, 
it was it was something all right it it, it sure was was something nearly 15,000 fans filed in at Newark New Jersey's Prudential Center a scant 11 miles from New York City on May 6 2018 to witness the territorial well, home team take center stage and how did they do well we need one of these let's see I need one of those to get me through it. <laughs> well, let's soldier through this together, shall we? Not a real cattle prod, look. The pre-show saw Ruby Riot defeat Bailey in decent, if unspectacular, match that was at least met with a lively crowd, which is good because even if the event itself felt a little limp coming in, a raucous New Jersey audience can help energize the proceedings. There was much energy to be had in the proper pay-per-view opener, where Rollins defended the IC belt against The Miz. Now, Rollins had been on an absolute tear in 2018 between his Herculean effort in the lengthy gauntlet match on an episode of Raw and his performances in subsequent IC title bouts. Now, The Miz may not be the athlete that Rollins is, but he's certainly been known to level up with quality opponents. And wouldn't you know it, Rollins versus The Miz was excellent. A 20 minute match with lots of complex spots and near falls, as well as a crowd that appreciated their strong efforts. A series of reversals late in the bout, culminating in Rollins stomping The Miz's face flat for the finish. You know, a nice capper on a top shelf opener. If you were watching Backlash in 2018, you no doubt at this point were thinking that you're in for a real treat because this was a great match to kick off the show. So remember that oddball comparison I made earlier at WrestleMania 34 and those horrific TV movies? Well, Backlash was unique in the sense that the Mr. Nice Guy boyfriend character flipped out far sooner than the template called for, except the ensuing two hour chase scene at the half the speed of a meander. To put it another way, you know how in like parades, the floats are always like elaborately decorated and pretty? Well, imagine a parade where the lead float looks great, but the seven behind it are just, you know, empty. Unadorned trailers being pulled by bland, sort of secondhand looking used cars. That's a better way to describe the remainder of this backlash. A frustrating parade of meh. We begin our turn into the maddening void with Raw's women title match, pitting Nia Jax against the individual she won the title from at WrestleMania, Alexa Bliss. Bliss and Jax were once allies that had fallen out in the weeks before Mania after a mean girl Bliss was caught disparaging her friend backstage. This set up the Mania encounter, where Jax captured the title in a, well, decent enough encounter. The Backlash match was pretty much at that level, nothing terrible, nothing most fans would remember a few days later. Jack's retained to blow off the two-show feud, and that appeared to be that. Except for a little bit of business that took place post-match. In a moment that was as natural as polyester, Jax gave a big be a star speech dedicating her victory to everyone that had ever been bullied and said that in the end a bully gets their ass kicked. Must have missed that PSA where Cena and like all the others sort of encourage the kids to stop a school bully by giving them a Samoan drop but you know Raw starts pretty late over here and I did have school the next day. Anyway, the fans booed this whole thing, partially because it came off hollow and manufactured thanks to WWE approved buzzwords being placed all throughout. I mean, who needs these pointless speeches? The WWE Universe is just here to see their favorite sports entertainers in action, hoping those superstars don't entertain too much to the point of their championship opportunities to where they wind up in a local medical facility. To prevent that, they need to create separation and avoid a landing on the apron, which by the way is the hardest part of the ring, while still putting on vintage performances as Raw rolls on. God damn it, they've got me doing it now. So the WWE uni... The WWE crowd is now kind of on live support as we turn into the next match. Brother Nero and the Viper for the 50 states and maybe a few acquired territories championships. Now, despite being two of WWE's most recognizable and decorated stars, Hardy and Orton fail to really wake the Newark crowd up and it's just in first gear for its 12 minute duration. Now, Orton did bust out one of his very patented chin locks. Which may explain the lack of excitement. Hardy ends up winning with the usual, unusual ending of what was functionally a TV style match stretched out to double time. 
Oh God, I'm sleepy. And speaking of stretching, this leads to an apparently endless segment involving Elias, the New Day, the Roost of Day contingent, No Way Jose, Breezango, Titus Worldwide, and finally Robert Roode in what appeared to be the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal touring group. I'd say this was a bad and pointless segment, but then it might sound like I'm bullying everybody involved and I don't really fancy getting my ass kicked per Naya's carefully written proclamation. But yeah, the hot dogs at the arena probably didn't have this much filler in them. Even, even if so, you could, I think you could probably eat one, crap it out, long before this, well, funny segment ended. So after that, the dirty dog story finally ended. It was up to Debry and big cast to try and well, wake up this very, very sleepy crowd and me, which is easier said than done. With all due respect to Cass, who would find stronger use in other promotions as a giant scary psychopath, nobody was really clamoring for Enzo's ex-partner to be an early roadblock in Brian's feel-good comeback tale. The feud felt like a major letdown the moment it started and pretty much a waste of Brian's return. This is kind of like if Daniel Day-Lewis returned to acting to co-star in Morbius. I actually really want that now. Imagine, it's Morbin time. In the end, Brian won a seven minute match clean as a whistle, but Cass attacked afterwards to continue the feud. You know, Roman got another title match after losing cleanly to Brock, so there is clearly a form of precedence here. Let's now take a moment to examine Uncle Dave's chart of asterisks. And here we are. On the plus side, there aren't any negative star matches here, right? It's not like we're being subjected to Shane O'Mac self-slipping hazardous running a gauntlet or some avant-garde Bray Wyatt crap that would make Tommy Wiseau cringe, you know? On the other hand, the show is so boring though that most ringing endorsement I can muster is, well, one match ruled and Bray and Shane weren't, weren't involved because otherwise we're just watching a paper raw. And honestly, it wouldn't get any better with Carmella and Charlotte's SmackDown Women's title match. 10 minutes of what well, mostly slowed down basics culminated in Charlotte missing a moonsault, jamming her knee, and then Carmella picking up a fluke pin, immediately taking the leg out. So the last three segments were prolonged fool's comedy, a match where the heels lose clean but attack the face to continue the feud, and a match where the woman who ended Asuka's long winning streak loses for the second time in a month to a lesser skilled mid-card performer. Sorry, Carmella, sorry. <laughs> Fortunately, there's only three matches left, which really we shouldn't be saying when we're watching wrestling. Fortunately, there's only three matches left. Though the only remotely interesting one is up next. Next up, it's Styles Nakamura 3. Ball shots take Manhattan, come on, for the WWE Championship. And it's a no DQ match. Despite WWE telegraphing a satisfying ending, general expectations are still tempered by their B-plus mania encounter, and then the needless sequel in Jeddah. Now the crowd does come alive a little more as there's potential for a quality outing that can at least rival Seth Rollins versus The Miz. So, I never thought I'd say that. Maybe if Styles and Nakamura can do well enough, they can come close to The Miz's level. But that's really where we're at with this show. Unfortunately, for the third time in a row, it, it wasn't Wrestle Kingdom. Instead, it was once again, Wrestle Dingdom, as in Dingdom, Dingdom in the Plums, as the entire final sequence focused on two men playing Rochambeau for the Magic Triangle. The result was more crushed nuts than an ice cream sundae and a double knockout to boot. This was a D, no DQ match, no DQ. Quite the metaphor for the show as a whole. We want to have a good time and then boom, right in the sack. <sighs> Next up was Lashley and Strowman versus KO and Sammy in what feels a little bit like a fever dream, especially given how beloved the latter duo would become in large part due to the Bloodline saga. But instead of nuanced characters, here they're just knock around idiots for the happy heavyweights to bully around. Oh, better watch out, Bobby, cause Naya might beat you up for being a dick to the dancing sky guy. We get some heel dissension and then Owens gets pinned with a bloody vertical suplex like it's the 1988 Survivor Series. Then both heels get beat up some more afterwards. The crowd cares about none of this because it's getting late and there's still one match to go. 
So, uh, one match to go. And it's a match with zero stakes and, well, a pretty obvious outcome between Samoa Joe and, and well, a, a Samoan Joe. Anyway, this match, it, it was totally unspectacular. Save for the fact that what was left of the crowd completely turned on it. Chance of delete, delete, and CM Punk, CM Punk, and well, this is boring, and the worst of all, beat the traffic, and that rang out over all 18 tedious minutes. At one point, the fans actually began to leave, and the lights were turned off in certain sections of the arena to try and disguise the emptying out process. So you see, kids, John Moxley wasn't the first member of the Shield to have a lights out match on pay-per-view. To the surprise of no one except maybe a Ring of Honor fan that had been living in suspended animation since 2004, Samoa Joe lost to the other Samoan superstar named Joe. And you know what? There may have been more fans in the crowd when Reigns won the Universal title in 2020. Now, you may think the crowd was a little harsh here, but it should be noted that Backlash didn't end until close to 11.30 p.m. local time, which is about 45 minutes later than a normal WWE pay-per-view off the time, without any advance warning that the show would, well, enter overtime. Going long is one thing, but after the hot opener, the show just sort of died a death with one insipid match after another, one bad ending after another, one half-baked character after another, and a throwaway segment that probably should have been, well, thrown away while the format of the show was being compiled. We're going to look at Dave's match ratings one last time. Uh, you can see the audience's irritation. As noted earlier, Mania and the Greatest Royal Rumble weren't great, but they didn't feel like this. New Orleans and Jeddah got mostly succulent cuisine with either an overcooked entree or lots of questions about the motives behind the meal. Compared to the attempted gourmet, Backlash was a bowl of expired Chef Boyardee, two pieces of bread, and a glass of warm Hawaiian punch. Not exactly Gordon Ramsay. Backlash wasn't bad on the account of bad matches fueled by bad creative. It was, well, it was bad because, opener aside, no effort was made to deliver a worthwhile pay-per-view. And that opener wasn't great because of a company effort. It was great because one wrestler is a world-class performer and the other is talented enough to hold up his end of a strong match. I do love you, Miz, really. Fans like greatness and they can, well, ironically appreciate crappiness if delivered a certain way, but they refuse to abide a half-assed job. The feeling of indifference around the event helped set the stage for the months ahead. Remember the fans obnoxiously counting down in the Iron Man match at Extreme Rules, or refusing to cheer Roman, even after WWE had Brock talk about how much he didn't care about the fans, or the backlash for Crown Jewel, the criticism for the unimaginative Survivor Series. You know, the year pretty much ended with a McMahon saying, hey, look, we're sorry 2018 sucked, but it's all Corbin's fault. The fact that All In drew the interest that it did with no national TV outlet to build the matches was a clue that something was rotten in the state of Connecticut. Of all the damning output to come from WWE that year, Backlash emitted some of the most putrid odors. You know, as of 2023, users of the Cage Match Results database rate Backlash 2018 a 3.38 out of 10, a telling 57% of respondents graded the show a three or lower. On the same database, Backlash is the seventh lowest rated WWE pay-per-view since the start of 2018. Four of the six lower rated shows, well, they took place in Saudi Arabia. Now, many of you in the comment section specifically requested Backlash 2018 for this series. You might think I'd be furious at you and your sadistic whims, but you know what, I'm actually not. Being honest, it was one of the best naps I've ever had. The, the video's finished and I'm awake. 